Welcome everyone to Gonzaga University. My name is Jeff Kelty and I'm our Assistant Vice President for Academic Development. We'll be starting here very shortly. We're just give folks another minute or two to log in. And uh, we're excited to join Dean Hu today, who is going to talk to us about uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Just one or two more minutes and then we'll get going. Thank you. Welcome everyone on this fine Monday to Gonzaga University. I'm on campus today, it's quiet. However, uh, we are excited to have a very special guest today in Dean Carlene Hu, our first year, just finishing our first year as the Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. As I mentioned, my name is Jeff Geldeen. I'll be moderating today's panel with the Dean and all of our colleagues from Gonzaga and all of our guests. Uh, a little bit of a snapshot of how we'll work, work through the day. I'll do a quick introduction of Dean Hu uh, and then uh, leave her with some questions uh, as far as uh, what's going on in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. We will leave some time at the end, last 10 minutes or so for questions, but if you have a burning question uh, relating to something specific that she's talking to, please submit it to chat and uh, we will uh, do our best to fit that question in, to read it out loud so everyone knows and pose the question when the time is right. Thank you, everybody. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. Uh, Gonzaga campus is quiet, but we are fast approaching uh, planning for the start of the semester, and uh, we hope to at some point to be able to see everybody again. Hope everyone's been navigating the pandemic successfully and safely. Today, I'd like to introduce a special guest and a great colleague I've had the pleasure to work with this past year. And that's a very special person, Dr. Carlene Hu, just finished her first year as Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. She has uh, brought with her a tremendous energy and leadership style, one that we uh, are so very fortunate to have. Dean Hu came to us from uh, Montana State University and she had served in multiple roles there. She has also spent time uh, as Associate Vice President for Research at Texas Tech University, and she has spent time as faculty member at University of South Carolina, University of Notre Dame, and also University of Pennsylvania. And I have it on good authority that when she was a student at the University of Pennsylvania earning her bachelor's degree, she was also a star volleyball player. And after University of Pennsylvania went on to receive her master Master's of Science and PhD from the University of Notre Dame in Chemical Engineering. She is a chemical engineer by trade. Uh, her resume is long and distinguished, so quite a bit more to go that I won't get into today. She has great experience in industry and also the academy, so we're very pleased to welcome Dean Hu. Uh, Carlene, if you don't mind, let's start it off and let me ask you today about what you drew, what drew you to Gonzaga University as the Dean of the uh, School of Engineering and Applied Science? And also, briefly, if you won't mind touching on a little bit, of, I know people are going to have these questions on the COVID, uh, how it affected us this spring, and potentially what you might see going forward. Carlene, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everyone, or, or good afternoon to some of those of you who are on a different time zone. And I'm, I'm glad you can join us. And I want to thank Jeff and his colleagues for setting up this uh, town hall, this exchange for us. When he first mentioned it, I, I was uh, really delighted that he thought this was an opportunity to share 
um, what is what has transpired? Where are we going with the School of Engineering and Applied Science? And yes, it's only been a year and not quite a month since I've taken this opportunity here at Gonzaga in Spokane. So thank you, Jeff and colleagues, and thank you for uh, to all of you who can join us uh, this morning or this afternoon, wherever you may be. So what drew me to Gonzaga is obviously the students and the faculty, the commitment to the kind of teaching, the commitment to the kind of advising that our students need in order to develop. And you know, when you think, when I think about the Gonzaga's mission of providing an exemplary learning community that educates the students for lives of leadership and service for the common good, I can't think of another um, discipline um, that would uh, that, that 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 can always deliver on on these these high ideals. Most of you may not know, but you know, our engineers. One one of our uh, uh, program education objectives for engineers is to is to develop engineer solutions. And these must be informed by our liberal humanistic values and to be well conceived and carefully implemented. Our computer science, most of you may not know that computer science is part of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. You know, we expect our computer science students when, when uh, in their education to bring critical intelligence to, to the development of the current and next generation uh, information technology that is also informed by this liberal humanistic learning. So when you think of, 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 of this, this, this base value system and how we um, grow our students, educate our students, help our students to mature, I, I think that Gonzaga really lives this mission day in and day out. And the faculty and the staff are dedicated to our students. And truthfully enough, our students themselves are dedicated to their own learning. And I find that what they do is quite sustainable here. So I'm, I'm very pleased to, 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 to be here and to witness and to see this in action. So, you know, Jeff, you mentioned what happened in the spring. I would say that the, the students in the School of Engineering and Applied Science have been the most resilient. And that could be because we are technology savvy. And one additional uh, factor that may not be known is that um, our students in C's are required to have their own laptop, their own computer platform. And so when we, have to, when we had to shift to fully remote digital distance delivery, it, it wasn't uh, the same hardships that m many other students might have faced. Yes, we all face maybe where we're located, the internet being not, not completely robust for us, but because our students already had a platform and because we have our own IT staff to help us, we're not that many, but just enough, we could always use more. We were able to support our students with the kind of, of platform they needed to complete their studies. And like everybody else who has labs, we are challenged with those, but our faculty, again, working with our students, we were able to move through that challenge um, th that we faced at that time. So I, I'm grateful that our students worked with us. I'm grateful that the staff and the faculty um, were able to, to move in the right direction and satisfy the needs of, of our students, of the courses, of the labs. Thank you, Carlene. Um, let's pivot to, uh, interested to hear your opinion after a year and also with your experience, what do you see as uh, potential opportunities with the current programs that we have in the, in the school? Can you touch upon that a little bit? Yes, and I'm gonna uh, put this in the following framework. Um, and, and most of you, I hope, will be interested in this, is sort of what have we, what have we accomplished and, and where are we going that would speak well to the programs that we have and, and growth and opportunity. And I like to think of it in terms of um, what were some of the priorities I'd set for myself or the school when I started back in June. And, you know, truthfully, my, my provost, who I report to, had, had, had asked all the deans for an annual report. And I must uh, tell you that I had five uh, priorities that I wanted to accomplish. And of course, given the time we have, we probably can only delve in the first two, which I think is important and it lays the groundwork for where the question you've asked Jeff uh, naturally takes place. So um, one of our first goals here was to get to our, our, our prepare our ABET self-study. So for most of you who don't know what ABET is, it stands for the Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology. Every college or school of engineering and applied science or whatever uh, names some, some of our schools and colleges take on, the programs need to be accredited. You want, you want, it's a very proud a star uh, of, of performance that, that we, we met, we've met 
the, the engineering criteria for when our students go out and, and, and compete in the field. And so preparing those self-studies are quite difficult. And in engineering, we had to prepare five of them. And these, these self-studies are like 150 page plus tomes that demonstrate the courses, the learning outcomes, program education objectives, and what and how we've accomplished them in a very systematic and intentional way. Computer science also is accredited in our School of Engineering and Applied Science, and that too had to be prepared. So I'm very proud of the fact that our, our CS leadership and our uh, accreditation uh, staff coordinator worked, worked diligently and tirelessly to get these, these tomes done and submitted in time for our uh, fall reaccreditation which would be in September in 2020. And we made the deadline. So that was, I consider that a top priority. We need to be accredited and we, we were. The second accomplishment uh, I was going after was to take a look at enrollment. And um, I reflected on, on how to increase enrollment, but at the same time, not lose quality. Most of you may not know this, but uh, since 2016, I believe, there was only one pathway into engineering, not computer science, just engineering. And that pathway was known by the acronym direct admit. And, and, and I, I thought about it and said, why would we not allow someone who not necessarily completely prepared for engineering, not be given a chance to major in engineering? And, and, and working with our admissions and recruitment and, and so many other offices on, on the campus and of course with the provost, we, we thought about it and decided we could create what's called a pre-engineering pathway. Again, the, 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 the structure I was thinking of is the fact that, you know, we have students coming from high schools and through no fault of their own, these students are not necessarily prepared with the, the, the math foundational requirement, in, which, is, which is one of one, only one of several uh, uh, primary things we look at to see if you can be successful in engineering. And if at the outset we want every student who comes into engineering to, to really be successful, you know, we, we should be able to set up an infrastructure that allows students who, again, uh, can become what we call calculus ready and, and, and make it in engineering. Um, this, this, this pathway known as pre-engineering pathway does not, um, um, uh, if a student does not make it through that first set of courses, it's, it's not that the student can't go on to another major in Gonzaga. So we're not admitting students who are not themselves prepared to come to another major in Gonzaga. It's just, if such students were given the opportunity to be in an engineer at Gonzaga, why not help them to achieve, to achieve their dream? So that was a second large accomplishment that, uh, from my perspective, it, it should make a difference. And I've seen it. In the current enrollments, we have 15 students who are declared to be pre-engineering pathway. And let me be clear, the direct admits does not mean that you're in a holding pattern. At Gonzaga, a direct admit means if you're, if you're directly admitted to engineering and you want to be a mechanical engineer, that's where you're going to be placed. If you're a direct admit and you want to be a civil engineer, you're, that's the program. So direct admits is not a holding pattern where then you, you, you choose. The fact is, if you, if you want to be a mechanical engineer, we're putting you into that program. That doesn't mean you can switch out of the program should you decide that, oh, I really don't want to be a mechanical engineer, I would prefer to be a computer engineer. So that was the second accomplishment, a big accomplishment for us. Other things that have been successful is the fact that we've started our strategic planning process looking out for the next five to six years. And yes, the, the, the planning process was disrupted by the current pandemic, but our faculty and our staff are still working diligent going forward and hope to pick up where we've left off uh, this past spring. Um, other, other notable things that have occurred, again, that sets the stage for where we can go with our programs is we were able to recruit two new assistant professors in computer science. And how is that important? That is imp important because when th thinking about computer science and the growth of computer science, the faculty in computer science are thinking about areas like cybersecurity, um, data science. And so with the addition of, 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 of two new assistant tenure track uh, professors, they can now manage the, the, the classes that we, we have to deliver, but also think about where the future is for them. And these are areas that if you could educate our students in them, they would be competitive in the workforce. Another accomplishment that we have made, uh, I, I, I think, is, is in the area of, of how we completed senior design. In fact, one of our senior design teams 
with the name of Magna Hip, actually placed third in our 2020 Northwest Entrepreneur Competition in what's called the technology category um, for their prototype of a magnetic repulse uh, artificial hip. And so despite the pandemic, we were still able to complete our senior design projects and, and, and our students were able to be successful at it. I also want to point out uh, another event that occurred with our senior design team uh, and, and how important is it to have industry projects and industry liaison on, on our student teams is the fact that two of our senior design teams working with Lung Technologies President Kerry Curran, they were able to complete um, the, the prototype design for what's called class two medical devices. In fact, Kerry um, was so delighted with the student's accomplishment that he sent an email to report that because of the senior, the, the student's accomplishments, um, Lung Technologies will be able to apply for um, patents. This is called utility patents of which the student team members will be assignees. So I look at that as, again, the wonderful things that our industry projects and our industry energy helps to, uh, for our students to see what the real world would look like, to help them see what professionals are like in practice, but also to bring the entrepreneurial spirit into, into, into uh, this activity. Um, and so when you think about it, from 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 that perspective, you know, senior design and what our, our teams could do. Another area that presented itself, I think, for potential growth for our program is something uh, called uh, is a combination of what's called construction technology, construction management, and and again, it was working with our, our school of business and administration uh, faculty brought to us the potential opportunity for civil engineering department or for engineering management department to consider what and could we get involved in construction technology and construction management. So that's another area we see a, a potential um, of growth for our programs to, to, to want to consider in, in the near future. A third area of importance uh, that again matured based upon our, our senior design activities, but also just the, the interest of our, of our, uh, of our um, uh, colleagues, our partners in, in the community is in the area of material science and manufacturing. And we have been working on putting together um, short course materials that could help our current employees um, consider uh, whether or not they could take these short courses and continue on with uh, getting a certification in, in this very, very dynamic area. And we have uh, some of our mechanical engineers and some of our civil engineers engage in that activity. And so that again is, is a growth area for us uh, that we see as maturing in, in, in the near future. Other things that make sense to us are some of the accomplishments that um, our faculty have achieved. For example, we've had our, our young faculty, uh, Professor Schultz, received the uh, Excellence in Civil Engineering Education Award. Um, our department chair in civil engineering, Dr. Rhonda Young, she received the Outstanding Educator Award uh, from the Institute of Transportation Engineers. And um, Mark Mazinski, also a professor in civil engineering, received the uh, American Society of Engineering Educators Inland Empire Section Engineer of Merit Award. This kind of award shows how our faculty are participating with our community, with the, within their societies, and that they're being recognized for the kind of teaching, for the kind of experiential learning they bring to our students, but also for taking on projects for which the community have value for. Um, and it goes on from there. In fact, I can say that one of our faculty, John Young, our young assistant professor, Dr. John Tadrus, received Gonzaga University's 2020 Faculty Award for Professional Contributions um, at, at, as, as, and he's, and he's uh, an assistant professor. So I see John, uh, John's career taking off um, in a very worthwhile uh, trajectory. What one of our senior faculty has also been recognized by, uh, by one of our societies, um, the IEEE Society, which is the uh, Ele Electrical and Electronic Engineering Society, um, Professor Talarico was named a senior member. To be a senior member of IEEE is a big deal. It means that he has made um, um, contributions to his discipline in a way that affords him not just, to, not just being a member, but being a senior member. It also means that there's a greater expectation that Professor Talarico will be uh, continuing uh, at the level of contributing to the profession 
And of course, the expectation is, is to do more. So I can go on and on in this direction, Jeff, to say that you know, we are looking at the opportunities um, uh, as well as um, others that may come our way, depending upon our, uh, what, our, what our community is looking for, what our partners have an interest in, and, and we welcome those of you who, who want to um, work, work, work with us and work with us closely. Thank you, Carlene. Uh, appreciate it. Um, sounds like it's uh, very exciting times. Tell me a little uh, real quick, and we'll have some questions coming in that I will uh, get to, but how have uh, engineering students changed today, say from 10, 15, 20 years ago? What, what are you noticing that's different in their, in their kind of approach and also how, what their ultimate experience is like at Gonzaga or really any engineering school? So I think that engineering computer science students have changed in a way that um, has been influenced by our the societies and have been influenced by um, the profession. We think along the lines of teams. Um, we recognize that when we go out there into the workforce, it's not always going to be a team of the same kind of engineer. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why senior design projects exist the way it is is so that you're on a team with more than one kind of engineer and you recognize that each, each of the engineering professions can bring something to the table, something to the solution. And so you'd be surprised how hard we work our students. You know, they're carrying 17 and 18 credits this semester and still they find time for the clubs and societies that are so rewarding to them. Um, many are engaged in looking at sustainable energy alternatives. Others are looking at how we can make use of technology um, for the disabled. And I think our students tend to be more inclusive and, and accepting of others who have a different um, outlook. And so we don't want each of us to have the same footprint. We like the fact that our foot can, can be very different, very diverse, very, very, very kaleidoscope. And they, they thrive on that. Um, and so I think that's the big difference is we are encouraging more of this activity, more experiential learning, more investigating on your own, more take the initiative, uh, whether you're in the classroom or outside the classroom. And I'm grateful that this faculty in CS actually um, encourages that kind of, 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 uh, of behavior, that kind of exploration. And this, just, just to play to this, Jeff, this is the kind of thing I think that can really blossom and go in different directions when we finally get the integrated science and engineering building on board. The interdisciplinarity, the multidisciplinarity is something our students want. Um, that I see as a change. The other change we are very conscious of is that as technology advance, we want to be part of the conversation of how that technology advances. As I said at the very start, not just because we are a STEM field, but we feel the Gonzaga's mission. We need to lead, and but we need to carefully put together solutions that are inclusive of others, not exclusive. So there are changes in the thinking. The changes in the delivery of the, of, of, of the, uh, the courses is what we're hoping we can get from the ISC. More contemporary classrooms, more opportunities to have that 360 degree look at everything, more opportunities to attract uh, a different kind of a student, to attract a different kind of faculty, to attract, to attract a different kind of visiting scientists or engineers so that we can see um, what lies ahead and be a part of the solution not part of the challenge or the issue. Does that help a bit? Yeah, thank you. Uh, before we segue to the new facility, I do have a question, if you don't mind taking one. Uh, and the question is this, as a parent of a senior, I'm concerned about internships, which is very important in preparing seniors for their career after graduation. What is being planned to deal in placing seniors and juniors for internships during this pandemic? Thank you for that wonderful question. And this has been a, an issue that our engineering advisory council has also brought to me, saying, how can we be helpful? And the question, of course, was, um, are, there, are, are these internships that might have been in place before the pandemic, are they still occurring? 
And so in a recent uh, uh, budget council meeting, and, and council members are, 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 um, are industry members, people who actually sometimes own their own business, um, they have offered some uh, video um, uh, tape, vi videotape um, 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 activities about what internships are like. But as far as I can tell, for those students who had, had internships, they have not been canceled. Um, these students were able to go on to their internships and of course the, the industry asked them to practice all the health and safety guidelines. So now what does the future hold? Because internships are uh, experiential learning experiences, some of our faculty have actually stepped up to try to provide more opportunities within the research academic environment to give our students that additional exposure to what it means to lead a project, um, 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 plan a project, and even um, what, what does it mean to, to go out and, and, and work with vendors to, to get different purchases, to work with different analytical labs? Yes, yes, it's not the same thing as an internship in industry. I completely hear you when you say, but that's not the same. But remember what an internship is. An internship is to provide an experiential learning that the student couldn't get otherwise. So the setting may be different, but the responsibilities not does necessarily change and one of the intangibles that usually comes out of an internship or sometimes you refer to it as a co-op is that in this experiential learning, the student matures. The student learns more about their discipline, more about their field. The student learns that perhaps I can think of my career as not just sometimes going out for that first opportunity, but maybe I can see a breadth of other careers, including, including graduate school or maybe a professional school such as considering going to law school or going to get an MBA. So yes, it's a difficult time, um, but we are also asking our council members and others that we interface with the community to give seminars and answer questions from our students about internships. What is it like? What is the day in an internship like? What is an internship about? What is the expectation of an intern? And so while it doesn't replace the actual experience, we have been thinking about how to manage this and in and how many different directions that we can to, uh, to still provide some experience for, for our students. Thank you, Carlene. Uh, we'll do one more quick question and then we'll jump. Uh, question, do you think that engineering and applied science is keeping pace with countries such as China? Development of advanced technologies such as 5G seems to have put China in the lead and generated concerns about national security. Hacking of universities and stealing of intellectual property is of concern. Can you share your thoughts on this? So I think we are keeping pace. Sometimes you shouldn't believe everything you read or uh, not, that, not that it's fake news, but I think that the whole story has not really emerged. And we fixate on, on on uh, multiple threads that sometimes when you sew that tapestry together, it, it gives you an outcome that you may have sewn the tapestry together to get that outcome. There was a time when we were worried about something called um, the storm. And when we looked closely at this, this the storm, especially when there was un the underlying statement was that we weren't graduating enough engineers. Um, and we looked closely at this rising storm, we really found that the story was incomplete. Uh, our co uh, the international com competitors were graduating, yes, maybe more students in engineering, but not necessarily the kind of students that could sustain their careers. In other words, there was a greater mechanical training, the skills, the mechanical skills were there uh, but the creative skills were not there. So it, you know, and, and so it looked as though they were graduating thousands of students who could go in and sort of hit the ground running. But what's really needed to sustain engineering, to provide robust and stable solutions, to look into other areas and uh, was the creative side of it. I think within the United States, and I've been teaching for a while and I've been in the academic uh, academy for a long time, is that we have to think about 
what are the characteristics we really want when we graduate an engineer or a computer scientist? Is it just the capability to reproduce what I've already done, to stay and keep pace? Or is it to look around the corner, to lift up the edge of something and say, why do I accept it to be this way? Why don't I think about it that way? And I think that's what we do, especially when we do things like our senior design project, or even in some of our labs and some of our independent study. We actually say to our students, you know, this is the path that appears to be today, but can you think about what that path could be five years from now? So, um, yes, I think that we are not only keeping pace, I think we're keeping pace and doing better in the areas that make sense. 5Gs is one issue. There are so many others, including, you know, can we find a cure for the, for the pandemic right now? Can we get a, a vaccine? As opposed to hacking and stealing, um, that occurs, um, it's unfortunate that that occurs, um, but our society, we need to always understand what risks are and, and, and I, I think, although we hear the negative stories, we may be fixated on the negative stories and not seeing the positive stories. So the whole picture hasn't come out yet, but it's incumbent on us to, especially at Gonzaga with the kind of value system that we have, to raise the awareness that the, the, these possibilities exist, not to back down from the challenges, but to continue the good fight. But, and I, do, I say fight in a very soft way, but continue the pace forward to educate our students, not just in the mechanics, but in the creative side, in the, in the intellectual side, in the exploratory side, in the leadership side, and of course, for us, in the humanistic side. We cannot forget our humanistic values. Thank you. Uh, we'll get to some more questions coming forward. Um, I would like, however, to shift, you mentioned our new integrated sciences and engineering facility. My colleague is going to put up on the screen a picture of this for our, our guests to see. Um, can you talk a little bit, Carlene, about what this facility is, uh, how it's going to change us and make us more competitive, and what people should know about uh, how this will change the School of Engineering and Applied Science? Thank you for that question. We in the School of Engineering and Applied Science are so delighted that our building construction is still going on in spite of the challenges uh, the current situation holds. Um, you know, when we think of STEM, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, two words in there resonate with us, technology and engineering, but there's also science right, involved in all of this. And at the heart of engineering is the concept of applying something. But long before we apply it, we need to understand it fundamentally. And I think that's where the science piece really comes into play. Engineers are mostly known for the design. Engineers are known for taking uh, that eureka that, and moving it forward into asking, who's going to use this? At what scale? Um, and we relish the concept of doing the design, scaling it up, running the pilot plans, and then taking it to, to, the, to the next level. If we have uh, colleagues, students in the same room with us who have some of the, the skill set that we haven't honed, but we can put those together and they can converge, that is what the ISC building is intended to do. And, and we're not fantasizing. We don't believe build it, they will come. This was a very well thought out plan. And I'm grateful to be the one of the deans that's recipient of this. I give all the um, accolades to those who have come before me. But we will be, I will be hopefully the recipient of seeing this thing uh, come from being bricks and mortar to something more than that. It will offer us a chance to have those spaces where we can collide with our ideas. And sometimes in that collision, something new will go forward, something better. Or Let's give us an opportunity to ask the right questions. Give us the opportunity to rethink someone else's perspective because as an engineer or computer science, we may not see it the same way as a biologist, as an environmentalist, as, as a physicist sees, sees, sees the same problem. And so we're hoping that the ISC building will continue, will not only continue to facilitate that at the level we're doing it right now, 
but to help it to flourish to the next, to the next scale. Um, and we, we see that for our students as well, that the more that they interact with each other, you might say the more one person's opinions or, or attitudes or behavior rubs off on the next, we, we see that as, as blossoming into something that we didn't have before. That's the same thing that can happen in the classroom, where instead of having one kind of pedagogy in the classroom, if we allow multiple faculty to teach within the same classroom, once again, we believe that when a student is exposed to uh, multiple pedagogies, to multiple experiences in terms of, of, of the, techno the, the technology we're trying to teach them, the, the actual fundamentals we're trying to teach them, that, that um, it will take us, take us to the next level of, of uh, teaching, of research, uh, undergraduate research experience, of, of even a creation of different labs, different, different way we run, run our labs, we see, we see this as, the, as a possibility. And also it's high time that we brought more contemporary ways of learning, more contemporary ways of doing research that keeps us um, competitive. Uh, many schools are looking um, to, to fan the flames for, for a STEM workforce. We believe a STEM workforce, and I think all the, 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 uh, the research out there shows that uh, as students, um, the workforce that's as STEM educated is more resilient, more flexible, more likely to, to, uh, to solve the challenges that we face today. So I look at the ISC building as that bricks and mortar that cements and, and gives us an, and underscores what we're trying to do uh, in the classroom, outside of the classroom, whether you're a faculty, whether you're a student, whether you're a visiting scientist, visiting engineer, or whether you're in, in somebody from industry who visits us and sees the kinds of, of, uh, of things we're trying, trying to deliver. Um, we also believe that at the end of the day, our students will have greater choice in their careers. They will not just think about maybe that first opportunity, but some of them may find that they have many more career options available to them, such as graduate school. And with this additional experience, they can be very, very competitive going on to, to, to graduate programs at top, top places. So we're very excited, Jeff. And if you could only see everyone, the, the banging and the pillars and the everything, you'd be as excited as we are. Thank you, Carleen. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's, it's going to be connected, correct, to all the other sciences building and create kind of a, a campus, a mini campus within the campus, correct? Absolutely. I, I should have mentioned that. Our hope is that we will have what's called a quadrangle of buildings. Right now, um, what you see behind me is known as PACAR. This is a picture that's there. That's not really the back of my office. You don't want to see what's in my office. Too many books and stuff. But this is PACAR. And you notice there's a, a sky bridge. It connects um, the PACAR, which is uh, the building, uh, to what we call a Herrick Engineering Center. And when the ISC building comes on board, Jeff, it will connect to PACAR. Um, right near Lake Arthur, but also have another sky bridge that connects over to the Hughes uh, Science Building. So I look at it as a quad, the quad of STEM. It were located in the most beautiful part of the campus, but our students will be able to go from engineering, science, math, and we also have the Foley Library very close by and the School of Business very close by. So we're in a choice location and we will be connected. Again, it's our way of saying you know, the structure should help to fan the flames of um, intellectual capacity. Thank you. A uh, question, Carleen, someone asked, and you touched on it a little bit earlier about the humanistic, but a uh, question was, are engineering students required to take liberal arts courses? Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe the, the Jesuit mission that we're all involved in here and, and what makes Gonzaga so unique and then how that relates to engineering students. Yes, we, we have to satisfy, everybody at Gonzaga, all students must satisfy what's called the core, university core. It's 45 credits that um, students uh, take in terms of um, understanding hu the uh, humanistic uh, social justice are uh, world, religion, of course, they have to take some math and some, some, some science. So yes, they are required to take it. And they're, we call them core broadening areas. And you'll be pleased to know that we expect our students to be able to, to write well, to formulate uh, strategies, um, to be able to use the um, uh, literature, contemporary 
modern as well as, as, as uh, older history to inform them themselves of how, how history came to be, how the different um, uh, eb, eb, um, eb, how things evolved in terms of um, man's growth, in terms of the planet. Um, we encourage um, our students to not only be able to write, but to be able to orate well. And, and, and look at things and they can take things in fine arts. We, we value fine arts. We, we value um, um, the understanding of, of, uh, of the ecosystem that we live in. So in, in some sense, you know, I, I, I see sometimes the challenge, Jeff, where we're, we're trying to satisfy the liberal humanistic side, the social justice, the needs for understanding um, the, different, the different paths we've taken sometimes collide against the strong engineering computer science content. And so that's why our students, if you, if you talk to a graduate, will say, my goodness, my, my time at Gonzaga was just flushed with learning all the time. Whereas most students can take 15 credits, our students are taking 17 and 19 credits a semester because we like to get our students done in four years. So yes, we do require the liberal arts classes, but we also ask that some of our own engineering and computer science classes also must embody some of those issues, some of those learnings, whether it's learning it through a project. As I stated earlier, when our students have to engineer a solution, we ask, in, in, how were you informed about this particular solution, right? Does it contain those um, elements for which we have considered, um, again, the social justice humanistic side? Um, have you thought about ethical, ethical responsibility of your solution? Have you thought about it from the point of view of um, your commitment to the profession and to the environment, right? Those are very, very important aspects of what we consider part of liberal arts learning, and how we ask that as you engineer a solution, as you design a solution, as you come up with, uh, as we say, um, next generation information technology, that you have to show that it has been informed by some of these uh, learnings. Um, many, many places, Jeff, don't consider that. They, they have a solution, they consider the right solution, but is it ethically and responsibly the right thing to do? And I can give you a couple of examples, but it, it, it it, it probably take a lot of time to develop. Thank you. Reminder, if you have questions, you can please submit those to the host. Um, Carlene, we're yeah, 15 minutes left, so I've got a few more questions, but one of them specifically is, as you come in and into your role as dean and you finished your first year, can you talk a little bit about strategic planning and how you're engaging, how it works at a university to work with our faculty and our uh, administrative colleagues so that as we work through our work into the future, how, how does the process work? So strategic planning is a difficult process. The most important thing to walk away with is that it has to be a bottom-up activity. Um, and and, and in, in, in the School of Engineering and Applied Science, our faculty and our staff are engaged in this activity. I've also engaged our Engineering Advisory Council, Engineering and Computer Science Advisory Council, and we have introduced, we have, we have introduced, we have um, uh, uh, six new members uh, at this joint council. And I'm proud to say that four of them are alums of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. And I've already tapped one or two of the new members to give me uh, their insights into strategic planning because many of our council members have their own companies, have gone to strategic planning so many times um, that uh, there's a lot to be learned from their experience as to how to be successful at this. And um, I'm so grateful that they have taken the time to spend the time with me, to take the time to look at where we have been and where we can go, to cement our value system, to consider that there's a timeline associated with what we're trying, if we say this is what we're going to accomplish, to not be overly wordy or overly extensive in, in planning, in, our goal, in, plan, in stating our objectives. Um, and, and, and then one of the most important things they've said to me is whatever you come up with, you can tell that it's meaningful because 
others can tell you when somebody stops them and say, so what is an objective of the strategic plan was the School of Engineering and Applied Science. A hallmark that this is working is that that person can tell you at least one of the strategic goals that we're trying to accomplish. And, and usually it's a five to six year plan. Um, well, we have been fortunate that um, the provost has uh, given me or allowed me, allowed C's to have an external consultant who's an expert in this to help us. Uh, as we go down the path of first saying where we have been and talk about where we need to go, uh, what's our priority. And, and right now, before we had to halt our activities, we came up with uh, six uh, what we call themes. And these themes may still be reduced. Six seems like a lot, and it possibly is. Uh, they possibly are, um, but this is where we need to work through it as 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 a school to determine if these really are our our themes. And let me just let you know what they are. I, I think they will resonate with most of you who are listening. And the first one, of course, is our reputation, our prominence. We want to be known as a school of engineering and applied science that does provide an education to our engineering students and to our computer science students for which there is, there is high value, quality, this is a byword, and be known to deliver on that. Um, we're interested in, in, in a theme that helps us to provide uh, continued financial support that support our student clubs. So many of our clubs, the students are engaged in so many activities for which the community benefits. And of course, the students' engagement with the community with challenges, world and, and regional and community challenges, they get their experiential learning, but the clubs need support. Professional development activities for faculty as well, that helps them to uh, you know, mature their career or sometimes advance their careers in, in areas that they had not thought of before. And of course, we need more funding for our senior design projects because at the end of the day, it, it, there is a cost to produce a prototype, there is a cost to, um, to get the software we need or small components. A third theme is, in, is enrollment and advising. Um, uh, I, most, most of you may not know this, but our, and you are alums, you may, maybe you do know this, that our faculty do advise the students, uh, and especially about their, their what, what the profession is about, what the long-term career plans could be, and, and just about anything that a student wants to have a conversation with their advisor. So we, we do want to be able to manage enrollment and advising and make sure that what we're offering the student is of the highest quality. We're interested in diversity. We'd like to diversify the student body as well as our faculty and, and staff. I'm proud to say that we have uh, better than the national average of uh, female uh, faculty and better than a national average of female faculty who are tenured and at the full professor level. That's very, very unusual in most uh, schools or colleges of engineering and applied science. But diversifying and, and being intentional about how we diversify the student body is an important theme because I think all the research shows that when you have a diversified student body and a diversified faculty and staff, that uh, greater creative juices, greater things can be accomplished um, be because we bring a kaleidoscope of perspectives to the table. And also, um, we want to promote another theme on interdisciplinary collaboration. With the ISC building coming on board, we would like the opportunity to uh, be, be, be fully engaged with our colleagues in the sciences and also with the fine arts and other areas as appropriate and business. Um, but we need, we, need, we need to understand what does it mean to have research undergraduate experiences? What does it mean to do these kinds of experiential learning? What is it going to take to do that? And the last thing, of course, again, is and the final theme is, 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 is people supporting the faculty and the staff to continue to, to, to learn about new technologies and to always um, um, refresh uh, their, their creative juices. The strategic planning process is a difficult one, but here's the exciting thing, Jeff. CES is looking at the next five to six year plan. Gonzaga for the first time is also putting together an academic affairs strategic plan. If these two can be aligned, 
it tells us how our, how we can get resources to to help us achieve our objectives. But it also helps us to understand where, uh, from an academic point of view, where Gonzaga is going. Uh, and so, if we can be aligned with that, I think we are satisfying both our own mission as well as the greater mission of the university. Thank you. Got about 10 minutes left. I've got a few more questions that have come in. Uh, Carlene, can you address a question? Will a composites facility be part of the new building where chemists and mechanical engineers can work together to contribute to the aerospace industry and more? I, I missed a couple of words again, Jeff. Can you say that again? I'll read it again. Yeah, certainly. Will a composites facility be a part of the new building where chemists and mechanical engineers can work together to contribute to the aerospace industry and more? We are thinking about that. That goes back, Jeff, to the question you asked about what are some of the, the, the things we see for our programs going forward. And I mentioned the materials, um, materials science, engineering, manufacturing. I look at that as a bigger umbrella for the very specific composites industry. And we are looking at some uh, research space that could advance that, including getting common instrumentation for a faculty in mechanical engineering, for a faculty in civil engineering, for faculty in, in, in chemistry who looks at the synthesis of these composites from a chemical perspective, while our mechanical and civil engineers may look at it from a strength, uh, structural characteristics perspective. We are thinking about what does it mean for the bigger umbrella of materials and then underneath that would be the composites. And yes, one of the focus we have been looking at is in the aerospace industry. Um, very, very deliberate, very, very intentional in our development of that. And I mentioned a development of a course for which we hope employees in industry, in the, particularly in this industry, would want to take this, this, this it's an eight week course in this area, just to, to, to um, build out their own, their own uh, educational, uh, education needs. We have gone to the point of investing in a new paint booth that looks at different kinds of paints. In, in that composite area. So we have some plans for that. I'm happy to hear from whoever asked that question, any more thoughts um, that, that, that we could expand on that some more. Thank you. And to reminder, a reminder to all participants, we'll have Carlene and my contact information up at the end of the uh, presentation. So you can email and we'll get back to you as well. Uh, another question, Can as many know, we have a partnership with the University of Washington and their medical school. Can you talk about uh, what the future relationship might be with the pre-med or medical community and the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, if any? Yes, we're very, very aware of our UWJU partnership in this area. And where can the School of Engineering and Applied Science play a role? And you may know that there, we'll soon see the, the McKinstry building coming on board that's also going to, again, provide that infrastructure, that, that common meeting place for, for these two programs to be successful. We're looking at uh, some bio-related uh, activity. Um, and for us, it would be things like biomechanics, um, biosensors, um, bioinformatics. Um, and so we have, long before I got here, there was a discussion about what does it mean to do a bio something? Could it be called bioengineering? Could it be called biological engineering? And, 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 and we want it from a multidisciplinary point of view. That's an ongoing conversation with C's leadership right now. But here's a tandem that we've looked at. Um, in the UWG partnership, when the McKinstry building comes on board, there may be an opportunity to provide some experiential learning for some of our students and our faculty. And we're thinking about how that can be done from the point of view of senior design projects because that is a year long activity. The students must take it in order to graduate. So could we begin down that avenue in a very intentional, deliberate way to work with the UWGU faculty and our senior design students and our faculty to see if we can um, um, find a path that, uh, that our faculty will be interested in to continue to, to build out this, this wonderful um, opportunity that we have at UW. Uh, more recently, um, we have been engaged Age with UW and WSU and others in, in, in an NSF uh, uh, pro, um, proposal that we're trying to submit that it once again would help us to look at the, the influence of the life sciences, the health sciences, the bio, the medical side in, 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 in areas for which um, our faculty would, be, would have an interest and be able to contribute. So we're moving forward in, in different directions 
but we're being thoughtful about how we do it because we're not a huge faculty. And we would need strong instrumentation and equipment uh, in order to really support truly, truly basic research. Thank you. Uh, here's a two part question. Can you touch on what percentage of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences student body are females and what programs might be in place to encourage more females to become engineers? What a thoughtful question. Thank you for that. Um, the number of females in our, our engineering and applied science uh, is probably just at the national average, which is probably around 24%. Um, and we need to be careful about that because we don't possess all the other engineering programs where these data might come from. Right? We don't have, for example, my area, which is chemical engineering, which predominantly has, if you look at a chem most chemical engineering uh, uh, undergraduate student body, you'll find it's about 50-50 men 50 and 50% 50 women. Um, so we do not have chemical engineering. We don't have industrial engineering, which is, a, once again, another area where a large number of females are attracted to. And so for what, what we have, I would say that we have an opportunity to grow. I don't believe that we are stagnant. I don't believe that we, um, it, it, it's, it's a huge concern for us. Um, could we do better? Of course, everybody wants to do better. Um, I'm proud to say, for example, that you know, where most uh, computer science departments may not have um, uh, females as faculty, we do, and we make a conscious effort of. In fact, uh, we have two of our faculty in, in, in computer science that are female. So, but, but how can we encourage more females to become engineers? Yes, we need to think to become engineers in computer science. We need to be very intentional in how we recruit Jeff. And that again, was one of the strategic plan themes that came out of that, which is how do we diversify our student body um, and encourage more women to be engineers? Um, at, if you have a few hours, we can talk about that. And I think it starts with me. Um, I think it starts with me and representing uh, engineering and computer science in as many forms as I can get to and being able to convey to our young uh, students um, what this career is all about. Uh, I don't think we, I don't think our programs and what we do need to change that much to be welcoming, but it could be also how they learn we need to think about changing how, not necessarily what. So that was a very thoughtful question. Thank you very much. I have a lot to think about and have been thinking about it every time I talk to enrollment and admissions, how we can go about increasing, and I don't necessarily say female, but even underrepresented minorities in, in, our, in, our, in our student body. Okay, thank you. We've got just a couple minutes. Um, can you talk about really quick what uh, we're doing with the strategic planning as far as how it may relate to offering advanced degrees in the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Where, yes, uh, very quickly because we're out of time, we're thinking of starting small with certificate programs. Uh, and, and of course, it, these have to be in areas of interest to, to the faculty. Um, and so we start there and these are usually small eight week course program, and then we can build on that from there and, and be as flexible as we possibly, possibly can be. The faculty are interested in that because they do want to satisfy their own career objectives. That's a short answer to a really d difficult question. Okay, um, final question, Carlene, and then I'll let you close this out. How can an alum, I had a question, how can an alum help and get involved? Oh, what a wonderful question, Jeff. Thank you for asking that one. It was on my mind. Um, you as alums, can help to um, bring the real world back to, to us. You know, we, we live in the classroom, we live in these academic walls. So ser serve on our advisory council, C come and give seminars to the students, maybe in these days by Zoom, um, to tell them what is, what, is, what is a day like in your career? Tell us how you got to your career path. What, what things did we, did, did we hopefully provide you with in your toolbox that could, that help to, 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 to to get you to where you are today. Um, come and visit us in the ISC building and, and consider if you could influence something different in the ISC building uh, new structure, what, what, it could, what could it be? And, and, and think along interdisciplinary lines, right? So that you can influence uh, 
mechanical engineers at the same time you can influence civil engineers. Remember I mentioned this construction technology, construction management possibility. How can you influence engineering management students as well as civil engineering students? How can you influence computer engineers and computer scientists? So you, you can help by bringing your expertise back to us. You can also help by um, maybe bringing some other technologies that we don't have that we that we, we could use to quickly advance ourselves for it. But I give you an open invitation to come and visit with me uh, in, in, in any time and also visit with our leadership and consider serving on our, on our council um, because we do need members who are active and are willing to take on some of the um, challenges that, that we face in seas. All right, thanks, Carleen. I, I'll leave you with some closing remarks and I appreciate everyone. If we didn't get to your question, we will do our best to get back to you via email. Uh, but thank you everyone for attending. It's been a great first year and Carleen, I'll let you take us home. I'd like to thank you all for staying with us this hour. And once again, I also thank Jeff and his colleagues for, for thinking of this wonderful way of bringing, bringing you to me and, and me to you. Um, there's so much I want to convey to you about the different things that are happening um, and some of you want more in-depth responses and more thoughtful responses to your question for which time does not allow, but please email me and, and let's work through if you have some ideas for which uh, we can work from. That's always a good start. I never ever claim to have, you know, a franchise on, on solutions and things change. It's dynamic. Um, I want to invite you to come and visit us when the ISC building is open. Um, Please consider if you have a business to an opportunity for students to, to take on internships with you. Um, in many, 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 many times I need also when my faculty go on sabbatical, they'd like to do a sabbatical with some of your industries to again give them that, that experience in industry they can't get in the classroom. And consider coming and give us seminars on, on, on your thoughts and ideas and, and don't hesitate from time to time to send me an email about how we're doing, how you see that we're doing, what you see that we're not working on. You'd be surprised how open myself and our leadership is to, to taking input from you. We, we believe without your input and support, we're going to be just an island adrift and just another school. That's not what we want to be. So thank you again for spending this very your precious time with us. And Again, if you have a question that I have not responded to that you'd very much like an explanation, do contact me and, and tell me how, how best to reach you, especially what time zone you're in. So with that, I wish you well for the summer. Look forward to hearing from us. We do send out um, um, postcards and, and our annual reports and, and, and our senior design exposition day brochure, which we're so very proud of. That should give you at least a pulse on what we do do here. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Carly, and thanks everyone for attending. If you have any questions, please email either of us. And we wish you a wonderful day and week, and stay safe. Go Zags. Go Zags. <laughs>